I think the context of the debt ceiling now kind of coming due, becoming more salient, is going to make for potentially a lot of weird things to happen in financial markets. So we should be extra attuned to that. And let us hope they can just get past this and raise the debt ceiling so this isn't a self-inflicted wound of the most grievous kind. That was Chicago Federal Reserve Bank President Austin Goolsby on Yahoo Finance earlier today addressing the need for Congress to raise the debt ceiling. Now, President Biden will meet with top congressional leaders Tuesday to try to come to an agreement. Democrats want to raise the debt ceiling without qualifications. Republicans want to see spending cuts before considering raising that limit. And lawmakers have until June 1st to take action. That's when the Treasury Department says the U.S. will run out of money to pay its bills. For more on this standoff, let's bring in Ian Bremmer, Eurasia Group founder and president. Uh, Ian, you know, we circled June 1st on our calendar because the Treasury has said that's sort of the date where the U.S. is essentially going to default. But, but you said that's kind of a conservative estimate. What are your models telling you about what that X date is? Yeah, the economists don't buy June 1st. Uh, members of Congress don't buy June 1st. Uh, our own Eurasia Group internal economic model uh, thinks later, uh, sometimes uh, in uh, mid-June at earliest. So in other words, uh, there are there's less incentive to come to a deal or punt before that June 1st X date. Uh, but nonetheless, it is coming soon, and the market implications are going to be real. Now, obviously, nobody wants to be blamed for a debt default, and we've got this meeting at the White House tomorrow. I mean, who's in a riskier position? I mean, if you think about Kevin McCarthy, he, he's got a very fragile party right now. He's obviously worried about his position as well. Is, is the pressure more on the Republicans than the president? Uh, the pressure is more on McCarthy individually because he has such a narrow majority and his party is so fractured. So, And you, you saw how hard it was for him to secure uh, the speakership, also how hard he was willing to fight for it. Um, he, he could easily lose his job over this. That's obviously not going to happen to Biden. Um, and any given uh, member of the Republican Party uh, has their own more narrow political interest they're willing to look after. So if anyone is in the hot seat here, it's going to be McCarthy. But um, what's really going to happen um, is that over time, as we get closer to government shutting down and therefore essential services that reflect 8% of the U.S. total economy, which means constituents are going to be really angry at their individual members of Congress if that happens, because they will be maximally inconvenienced. That's when you'll start to see people buckle. We aren't there yet. And the whole problem with this entire debt limit crisis is until you create a crisis that feels real and causes actual pain for the people that are voting, they are highly disincentivized to come to a deal. Ian, it sounds like you think both sides really have a lot to risk. The American people, obviously, a lot on the line here when it comes to the personal impact. And this, of course, comes on the heels of a new poll out from Washington Post and ABC saying that President Biden's approval rating hitting a new low. He's trailing behind Trump and DeSantis potentially here in 2024. What does that tell us just about where the priorities should lie for the Biden administration and what the next year could potentially look like? And that Biden should look like a centrist. So ultimately, uh, he should be more incentivized towards a deal to be a responsible person that gets this done. That is, of course, how he won uh, back in 2020. Uh, but still, uh, not until uh, there's real pressure uh, that forces the GOP to the table and they're not there yet. Uh, but look, anybody out there, and I, as you know, I travel around the world, I talk to a lot of foreign leaders, and very few of them believe that it is plausible that President Trump, after January 6th, after two impeachments, after all these court cases, could possibly win again. It is likely he's going to get the nomination. It is absolutely possible that he can be president a second time. And anyone that wasn't believing that just needs to watch that poll. And that's leaving aside what Biden's health is going to look like over the course of the next two years, 18 months. So this is a this is a really big issue and people need to actively 
uh, you know, adjust their risk assessments as a consequence. I mean, I was thinking about the big uh, speech that uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, gave last week about the new Washington consensus. And the biggest challenge with rolling out a strategic policy plan, I don't care how well thought it is, is that if you don't believe as, a, as an ally or as an adversary of the U.S., that the Americans are going to be credible to hold on to any policy they have in a couple of years' time. Nobody listening to Xi Jinping thinks that, but for the United States, there is proximate domestic political risk around all of this stuff. Yeah, and Ian, speaking to that, when we talk about the confidence in the government and government officials and business leaders, we have been looking at the polls now. That has been declining for quite some time. What does that say just about the current environment, how that really shifts the strategy of either Democrats and Republicans and how we potentially fix that issue? Small business leaders um, are respected. Uh, scientists are still respected. Um, but frankly, uh, the military, uh, the serving military in the United States are quite respected. But overall, uh, levels of trust for politicians, for mainstream media, for individual CEOs has gone to the toilet in the United States. Uh, some of that uh, is a uh, general polarization of the House of Representatives and the corporate mainstream media. I think those are a big piece of it. Uh, part of it is social media um, and the drivers of, con I was just looking today. Uh, there was a wonderful poll that came out, I think it was Pew Research, uh, that was looking at how Democrats and Republicans self-identified uh, do or do not trust different aspects of the media. And the Weather uh, Channel came out number one, which of course is almost always wrong, but we trust them to be wrong, so that's useful. But after the Weather Channel, PBS was number two. And it's it's kind of interesting. I saw the poll on Twitter, and of course, PBS is the one that doesn't tweet anymore because uh, Twitter uh, decided to take them on as state supported. I mean, literally almost everything one could do in an environment to create mistrust for the way information is disseminated um, and, and incorporated into your worldview is happening at speed hmm. right now in the United States. So when you say, what can we do to, to change it? No, 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 it's what can we do to make it worse? Because th that's actually where we're headed. Well, that's on a negative note there, Ian. Let's talk about the new Washington consensus. You just mentioned yeah. uh, Jake Sullivan unveiling this. Uh, this is essentially the National Security Advisor talking about the new approach that the administration is now taking towards China as one of not decoupling, but of de-risking, reducing the exposure to China. Uh, you don't just talk to lawmakers, you talk to business leaders as well. What are you hearing from them about how they're viewing the Chinese market right now? Uh, I, I think that de-risking is the way that many CEOs are thinking about the Chinese market right now. They still believe in it. They still believe that China is likely to be the largest economy in the world uh, within, say, six to 10 years. Um, but they also do not have a lot of confidence about what the regulatory environment, the legal environment will be for them to operate inside China. And they also don't have a lot of confidence of what the sanctions environment, the regulatory environment will look like in the United States towards China. And in that regard, they're not taking investment out of China, but they are pausing or reducing the scale of increased investment that they're making into China right now. Now, having said that, let's keep in mind that U.S.-China trade right now is at historically highest levels it's ever been. And you would never know that from going to Washington and listening to policymakers. Yeah, certainly. And also, Ian, there's certainly been a shift in rhetoric when it comes to China and the role that China could potentially play in peace talks with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. At least there has certainly been some shift from the U.S. and a number of its allies. You're out with a uh, the, the paperback launch of The Power of Crisis, a new epilogue on the Russia-Ukraine war. I'm curious, from your perspective, we have certainly been hearing signs that Ukraine is starting to take uh, the counteroffensive. Where do we stand in this war and how do you see that potentially going? So we have had an extraordinary amount of alignment between the United States and its allies on the Russia-Ukraine issue 
over the last 15 months. I mean, really far beyond what anyone could have imagined in terms of the military support for Ukraine, uh, in terms of the economic sanctions and other related punishment, the freezing of assets of Russia, and also just the general diplomatic engagement and transparency among all of NATO, among all of the EU. I mean, even 27 EU states during a war saying we want Ukraine to join the European Union. That is quite a statement, staggering for all those countries, even Hungary, signing up for that. Um, having said that, uh, the war, I mean, no one in Ukraine really believes that they're going to be able to take all of the land back that the Russians have stolen from them. So how do you get from here to a conclusion? And what the Chinese are now doing after Xi Jinping has belatedly, but nonetheless, spent an hour on the phone with Zelensky on the anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster, nonetheless. And Xi Jinping can now publicly say, I'm the one guy with global influence that can have a strong high-level conversation with both Putin and with Zelensky. No one in the West can do that. Uh, and you know, when we get past the Ukrainian counteroffensive, we'll see how successful it is. Uh, you're going to see not just the Chinese, but an awful lot of countries in the world say, look, it is time to start talking. It's time to try to get a ceasefire in place. The Ukrainian government probably won't support that. Lord knows the U.S. won't support that. But there'll be a lot of voices that do, maybe including the French, by the way. Um, and I think that Xi Jinping today is diplomatically in a much better position than he was in six months ago, nine months ago, 12 months ago, when he felt a little sheepish about his close relationship with President Putin. That is less of a, of a liability in Xi Jinping's mind right now. All right, Ian Bremer, we really appreciate you taking the time. President of Eurasia Group, also author, The Power of Crisis. Thanks so much. Good to see you.